everybody and welcome to the latest HFS video cast. My name is Sam Duncan and I'm one of the analysts here at HFS and I think we'll all agree I'm joined by three very interesting people today. I've got Sakat Sinha, Senior Client Partner at IBM Consulting. I've got Haranda Misra, Chairman and CEO of GMEX Group and I've got Michael Kessler, the CEO and Founder of Tokenize. We're going to be talking all things tokenization today, something which I personally believe has the potential to change how we fundamentally exchange value and I'm sure you can imagine that could have a big impact on financial markets. But before we dive into the discussion, perhaps a quick round of introductions. And I'll start with you, Saka. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Sam. Thanks. Uh, Hirandar, good seeing you. And, and Michael, so good seeing you. I'm Saket Sinha. I lead IBM's emerging tech and, and blockchain digital asset solutions for financial services uh, globally. I've uh, been with uh, IBM 17 years and very much involved in the emerging space of uh, tokenization digital assets and everything to do with the new wave of uh, innovation that is happening in this space. Thank you. Perfect. And um, over to you, Hiranda. Um, I'm Hiranda Misra. I'm uh, chairman of GMEX Group. Um, and GMEX has been around 10 years, uh, but actually, particularly in the digital asset space, for about five years now. And we see a lot of opportunity with the convergence of what's happening in traditional finance with this new form of uh, decentralized finance as well. So very exciting and glad to be here. Perfect. And last but not least, Michael, if you'd like to do a quick introduction. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm Mike Kessler, CEO and founder of Tokenize, um, which is a group of regulated entities. So we have a um, stock exchange, a brokerage license and a central securities depository license. And again, very excited to be here with my esteemed colleagues. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. So I think everyone on the call today will agree that we've seen quite a big spike in the interest of tokenized assets. Now, a lot of you might immediately jump to examples you hear about maybe rare art, sports teams, collectible wine, but it extends far beyond that to the likes of financial services too. So I personally, I immediately think of how tokenization could lead to fractional ownership of assets. And I'm sure that could lead to reduced barriers of entry to investment. So lots of great, interesting use cases there. So I think we'll stick with you, Michael. Why do you think there's been a growing interest in tokenization and how do you think it's changing the financial services industry today? So I think the actual tokenization, I think it, it's a development of the crypto world. Um, I think it lends some of the properties from crypto, but obviously in terms of securities are, are vastly different to the crypto world. So we only focus on the securities side, so the regulated space, rather than the um, crypto side. But I think some of the hallmarks and some of the technologies are useful within them. So I think what we're seeing is we're starting to see that people are demanding different types of investment products. And I think what we've seen from the crypto world is that the retail public are the ones who particularly got involved in in crypto and investment-based technology, and therefore they're looking at what the next iteration might be. As regulators around the world start regulating crypto more and more and determining that things are securities rather than crypto, I think what we're seeing is we're seeing a convergence into regula the regulated space. And I also think that what you can do, not necessarily using the technology, but just using kind of instinct and what is a requirement within the marketplace is creating different types of asset classes, different types of instruments that weren't there before. So typically, when you're trading in securities, typically you're trading either equities or bonds or funds, potentially funds as well. Um, I think what you can now do with, because of they've shown this through crypto where you can have things to say 16 decimal places, you can fractionalize an asset far more easily. Now, I'm not saying that that necessarily applies within the securities world, that people will fractionalize assets, but you could fractionalize assets. So I think what people are seeing is that if you can fractionalize a Bitcoin, as an example, which is a virtual currency, um, then you could also fractionalize 
anything. So you could fractionalize shares, you could fractionalize a painting, you could fractionalize a building, you could fractionalize a revenue stream, you could fractionalize any of these items. And if you think about it, shares are fractions of the business. So I think what we're seeing is a new kind of breed of asset class that is being developed that is complementary to what the investors want. It might be more on the retail side than the institutional side. And I also think something that we're, we're quite close to as well is in terms of social media and social networks. So things within the fan-based economy have millions and millions of people following these um, whatever, industry leaders, or it may be a, a music artist, a film studio, whatever it ends up being. And I think we saw it with things like GameStop, that the power of the community within the retail populace has the power to drive change and potentially affect where the institutions used to be kind of master and commander of that domain. So, Mike, I, I like how you described described it. I think uh, uh, one point that that caught my attention was the fractionalization of uh, asset classes, right? So, it's the illiquid asset classes which stands most to gain from this fractionalization aspect, leveraging technology of blockchain, where provenance and traceability and authenticity can be almost guaranteed on the network, and that creates the ability for those kind of asset to find more liquidity, more exchange of hands, more tradability, and, and more pervasive, I would say, democratized ownership, which increases the attractiveness of those assets, as well as ability to leverage on them and build further value on top of them. And that's what, uh, you know, in my, what I'm seeing with some of the examples that we are leading in, where tokenization has really come to fore or come to strength in terms of how financial services, especially capital markets, are looking from tokenizing of these kind of assets. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree uh, with both of you, actually. I mean, you know, one of the things that we've seen with a lot of the work that we've been doing um, uh, on issue and secondary trading side and, you know, working with the likes of tokenize, I mean, it allows people to be much more creative. Um, and that that can be, you know, in terms of what's being tokenized to allow kind of capital raise against those assets, but also secondary trading them on some kind of marketplace and things like, you know, bundling rights and perks together within tokens and using smart contract uh, capabilities, but also, um, you know, the ability to own certain tokens that are more sentimental rather than intrinsic financial value um, and going back to what Mike said, such as, you know, fan tokens and things like that. So I think um, the possibilities are endless. Um, we're really excited. You know, it's not a magic wand, you know, a liquid bond will still be in a liquid bond, whether it's tr in traditional form or tokenized. But, um, you know, these sorts of uh, wallet integrations and, and uh, distribution effects uh, certainly um, provide a lot of future potential. Absolutely. And ju just to add to that, I think what's also interesting is in terms of the globalization and financial inclusion. So if you have the ability for somewhere, say like Argentina, which has 82% inflation at the moment, yeah. if, if you were to be able to tokenize, let's just say the Empire State Building as an example, and you gave people in a high inflationary environment, the ability to buy a stable asset in a low, there's no low inflationary environments at the moment, <laughs> but relatively low inflationary environments, then I think what they can do is instead of seeing the value of their $100 go down to 99 in the space of a couple of days, they could put those assets or invest those assets into a far more stable environment. And it doesn't necessarily create liquidity but it certainly helps towards it. So if you had thousands of people that own the Empire State Building, as opposed to two or three pension funds, then you have the ability to trade those assets far more conveniently. Right. And also you're giving people access to those assets that they would never have access to before, which was the preserve of the, the kind of VCs, right. hedge funds, pension funds, insurance companies. That's fantastic. It's all um, 
sounds very prominent, especially with the macroeconomic environment at the moment, everything we're seeing globally. And then when you think, I like, Michael, your point on financial inclusivity, so that makes absolute sense. But I think when, when we're talking about blockchain, tokenization, distributed ledger technologies, a lot of people tend to immediately jump to ecosystems. And I think that's a view we share here at HFS. So we believe that true innovation begins when multiple organizations are collaborating to drive new sources of value. It's, it's essentially our one ecosystem model. And I suppose the collaboration between GMEX, Tokenize, and IBM may be one small example of that. But Haranda, I'm going to end this at you. What ecosystems do you think need to emerge to support end-to-end -end tokenization? And sort of a three-pronged question, I suppose. So that's the first one. Secondly, do you think the industry is ready for them? And thirdly, I think I'm going to try to leave this back to real-world examples. How do you think traditional financial services firms are trying to participate in these ecosystems? Quite a lot for you there. <laughs> yeah, no, excellent questions and questions within questions. I mean, one of uh, one of the things we've got to realize actually when we speak about blockchain is I mean, it's not one ubiquitous technology. You know, there are a hundred public blockchains out there, and then obviously there are multiple uh, private DLTs as well. And at the same time, actually, um, you know, you'd be naive if you think that traditional financial systems and infrastructure is going away anytime soon, because there's a lot of activity on those systems. You know, you've still got uh, banks uh, running, uh, you know, mainframes, uh, uh, and and uh, you know, IBM were uh, were pioneers in that. And now, you know, now we're working with new technologies like blockchain. So I think what what we're seeing out there is it's got to be a network of networks approach. Um, that's both collaborative, but also has APIs on the one hand, and then uh, multiple private and public blockchains on the other hand to foster intro interoperability, because you can't have these things running as islands. And of course, everyone wants to um, expand their own franchise, and there's revenue opportunities there, whether you're an asset manager, uh, a bank, uh, a broker, a custodian. Uh, but there's also a need for horizontal integration across the market uh, so that everything can talk to one another, another. and um, you, you know much like um, you know telco markets involved or you got ubiquitous technologies like uh, that, that that came in to make things easier you know what technology fragments it can certainly knit together so that 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 you know leads to an opportunity and I think you know it's great to be partnered with IBM and working with tokenized because we can certainly uh, see opportunities there and and then it it becomes a distribution play because when we speak to the market are they ready yes they are uh, and what they want is they want something that uh, they explore with with knowledge uh, that they dip the turn the water with that can then scale uh, but they want a revenue case around it where we're, we're certainly seeing uh, so that even if there's some kind of upfront cost, they really know that there's going to be a return on uh, investment. Um, we speak actively to the buy side, um, you know, tier one, tier two asset managers, and there's some general themes emerging that are quite interesting. One, um, they want to access multiple custodians, and some of these custodians will be on different blockchains and different uh, technologies because they want to hold assets. And once those assets are held, they, they want the ability to tokenize those assets and distribute them through new forms of markets. Um, uh, you, you know, and some of those markets will have their own custodians and some will have third party custodians. And why do they want to do that? Because they want distribution to new types of potential consumers and, and participants through wallet integrations. So what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot more of what we see as traditional banking wallets kind of integrate with what we're seeing with crypto wallets and that and um, movement between these two ecosystems in an integrated fashion. Um, you know, and regulation actually is an opportunity, not a hindrance, because, um, you know, trust in the ecosystem. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that we call it trustless, but there does need to be a degree of trust. And, you know, when things go wrong, a degree of policing. Uh, just so that more and more people can use it and investor protection is important. Can I just add, I think it's also just worth highlighting that blockchain, as useful as it is as a technology, is not the be all and end all. For example, we don't actually trade on the blockchain. We use the blockchain for the settlement part of the process. So I think it's, it's great in terms of settlement and it's not necessarily great in terms of trading because things like gas fees, depending on what chain you're using, and it's also not necessarily very fast. So some, like Karanda was saying, some traditional technologies are far more appropriate to the industry than blockchain. 
and you know, just to touch upon that point uh, as well, you know, what we're going to see, um, you know, I call it. Yeah, everyone speaks about traditional finance or tradfi. Everyone speaks about uh, cefi or centralized finance, which is uh, some of these exchanges running central order books, whether it's for security tokens uh, like like tokenize, or whether it's um, the, the 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 likes of others like Coinbase for crypto, etc. But and there's also decentralized finance, um, which um, you know is effectively smart contracts um, and interaction uh, between different participants. That's more peer to peer in many in many ways. But we're going to see interoperability between these three constructs, and I I think it's really really exciting because that lends itself to what I call hi-fi or hybrid finance. Um, certainly, you know, if you look at this in day to day world, all right, we had paper posts and letters. Then email came along. Then we've got instant messaging, and now have many workflow apps. But they all coexist, albeit you know the different activity and the volume of activity between those buckets varies. And we're certainly going to see that in our industry as far as capital markets is concerned, and beyond that as well. No, I fully agree with you, Render. Along with HiFi, we will soon have our emergence, seeing the emergence of MetaFi as well, and finance and metaverse, right? So these are all things happening in our lifetime. Uh, one key question that I mean, uh, not question, but observ ob observation that I have noticed is that uh, in the traditional capital market space, every entity that are traditionally involved in making the capital market work, all those entities are looking into uh, the aspects of tokenization and how they will participate when securities gets tokenized, assets gets tokenized, and, and, and being ready to accept or facilitate those transactions. Uh, we know in capital market entities are there uh, because of, you know, uh, some are making the market, some are providing liquidity to the market, some work on the buy side, sell side, uh, some are looking at arbitrage opportunities. And uh, with this technology of blockchain coming in, uh, you know, a lot of those entities will find challenge in terms of uh, uh, proving their relevance because the trust factor will be inherently there. And as a result, the pace of adoption and innovation in the capital market is highest that we've seen because people are really, really looking into how they will make themselves relevant to that, uh, to that industry. So to that expect aspect, the entire plumbing of capital market as we see today are getting replumbed uh, in terms of how they will deploy and use blockchain. Right? You see large banks and large financial institutions announce uh, successful POCs and successful pilots. They're doing one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many basis. But those are all the building blocks of tomorrow's financial market as they will evolve. And as this plumbing comes into effect, the entire life cycle of tokenization will be available in the same way as capital market functions today, more efficiently, more timely, and more in real time uh, with a lot of trust and a lot of regulatory observance that will be baked in in the solution itself, which will cut down the cost of operation or helping support those kind of trading transactions. So as tokenizations are coming in, the relative market infrastructure is also being stood up in right in front of our eyes as things are, things are happening. So all big banks, financial institutions, I mean, yes, yesterday, Bank of New York Mellon announced, the oldest bank announced the, announced the you know, uh, services for digital custody. These are the market making infrastructure foundational building blocks that will support the tomorrow's world of tokenized securities and tokenized assets. Haranda, I'm glad you brought up regulation yourself because it's something I was hoping to touch on a little bit. And I, I thought your sort of line on what technology fragments it can link back together was quite impactful. And then I think the point on blockchain as well, Michael, I think not being the be all and end all, I couldn't agree with that more. I think our research shows that it's much more a piece of the puzzle in a wider sort of technology ecosystem and a wider ecosystem as opposed to, I think, as you said, the be all and end all. So that was perfect. And Saka, you, you leaned into my, my next question for Haranda. So what does the future hold for tokenization? So where do you think the industry is going with its tokenization efforts? And I think we've already spoken about capital markets, but like, how will it change capital markets and what should traditional firms be doing? Yeah, I would say um, doing nothing is not an option. It's happening now. And, and there's, certainly, um, there's certainly a lot of opportunities uh, afoot. I mean, there's a big opportunity, for example, to package existing assets and integrate them into kind of new digital and crypto rails um, with traditional payments as well, as well as crypto payments and using crypto assets. To, and at the same time, um, you know, effectively transcend and, and create effective settlement between these, these constructs. And certainly, 
you know that that to me um, is is interesting. And you've got certain organisations out there who are fundamentally even saying, look, if we don't do anything, our traditional way of doing something is going to cease to exist. Um, th there's some exciting developments, for example, the likes of uh, Namira have created Laser Digital uh, as a standalone entity, you know, to to totally focus on digital assets. So it's not a case of you know theory. There's very much uh, uh, the, the practice there as well, and we're beginning to see real innovation in terms of structured uh, products uh, as well. So even if um, some of the U.S. players uh, are a little bit more reluctant to come into crypto directly uh, because of uh, U.S. regulation and regulatory clarity, what they are doing uh, is coming into this asset class from a custody standpoint. Sarket. Um, talks about uh, often, but also from the perspective of uh, tokenizing real world uh, assets um, and also creating new types of products. For example, on the asset management side, whether it's uh, crypto exchange traded products or, or metaverse funds, we've very much seen the tier one asset managers go into that space. But for these types of products and distribution, you also very much need that infrastructure layer to 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 be effective and uh, and some of this activity is going to continue to be off chain and certain types of participants will be uh, and there'll be certain types of activity on chain uh, and the infrastructure that binds up on chain and off chain together uh, is is key uh, as as we move forward as well and and there are going to be hybrid instruments as well because there's certain asset classes we're seeing that are traditionally listed but we're also seeing them being tokenized to distribute through exciting exchanges such as tokenize uh, as well. So I think this is really exciting. I think the traditional world uh, and the digital uh, tokenized worlds are converging as opposed to being two parallel worlds that are competing with each other. I think just to add to that, I think what we're seeing from a tokenized perspective, and I think it's quite interesting, is some of the traditional asset classes like equities is you're very dependent on the directors of that company to perform and create a profit for that company. So what we're looking at now, for example, we're looking at um, what we call a royalty token, which is basically a contract for future revenue. So not you're not associated to the profits of the company because profits can be fairly easily manipulated by people, whereas revenue can't be. So if you give people a distribution of the revenue, you know exactly what you're entitled to, and you could also have it as asset backed. So for example, we're looking at a property um, in the Caribbean where it's an office building. We're looking potentially at tokenizing the revenue stream that that generates with a hurdle mark so that they're covering their costs. And then it's also asset back so that they would, would have fractional ownership of the property itself to add as added security to what they're doing. So I think creating these new different asset classes, I think is in keeping with what we're seeing are the demands of tomorrow's investors today. Right. So, I think they want to see these new asset classes because some, sometimes the traditional means are just not suitable for the current purposes. No, Michael, and, and to add on to that, I mean, the, the, the cost of maintaining those kind of new asset class, like you know, fractionalized revenue stream and ensuring that they are, they are paid in fairness with all the regulatory and audit capabilities and stuff like that, that becomes so easy these days with such emerging technologies yeah. Supporting supported by tokenization. That that's the natural gravitation. Market always gravitates toward efficiencies, right? That's where the the, the business growth and, and and economies of scale come in, and that's where the, that's the reason why tokenization is the future, because it's not it allows you to function at that fractional level, at fractional cost of what it takes today to function at at, at current 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 level and with instantaneous settlement and with rules completely baked in and with completely auditable way in which you know things are paid, interest rates are paid, derivatives are created. I mean, those, those are mind boggling operational nightmare that have become so feasible and easy to manage in the tokenization world with the technology. Great, and I think um, looking at the time, I think we have time for one last final question. And I'm gonna open this up to the room, I think. Um, so if anyone wants to chime in on this one, how do you think big tech vendors like IBM, like yourself, how do you think people like that can help in this industry with tokenization? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm fortunate, like, you know, uh, we in IBM uh, understood the trend that would be enabled with blockchain technology quite early on. So we have invested a lot and in, in building platform solutions and uh, delivery capabilities around, around blockchain technology. And we know that innovation will be driven off this platform. Blockchain will become or is becoming the underpinning framework as we see the evolution of Web 3.0 happening right in front of our eyes, right? Uh, we have always focused on making things run and, and, and execute. While we supported a lot of uh, proof of technology, proof of concept, uh, we have focused heavily on getting this solution to production live production, meaningful production, where you know actual business transactions are being done beyond the environment of POCs and, and proof of technology. Now, we have also learned the hard way that uh, doing proof of technology, proof of concepts uh, is one thing, but getting these kind of solutions in a multi-network environment in production is entirely a whole different ballgame. It has huge dependency on the infrastructure, on the security, on the resiliency of the system and, and, and infrastructure in place. And that has been our core strength of the infrastructure. So we are looking at this whole evolution from what kind of infrastructure the market would need to operate effectively, efficiently at a low cost barrier, as well as in a secured way. And Hirender mentioned earlier about this network of networks as these ecosystems and innovative ideas come across across the globe, they will have to interact with each other across multiple blockchain chains, across multiple networks and such. So we are right now very much focused and in terms of developing interoperability protocols, for example, how to make one network talk to each other, how to translate the governance and consensus mechanism of one network into another's, as well as developing uh, uh, software development kits, SDK for token management, for security, for identity, for credentials. These are the fundamental building blocks that will govern uh, the, the prevalence of these kind of use cases on, in, in the industry system. And that's where we are, we are engaged in, right? There are thousands of companies that have come up with technology to create a token, but there are very few companies like IBM who are working on the foundational architecture and foundational infrastructure to make this work in a secured and financially regulatory compliant way. That's the strength and that's where IBM is, is contributing in this whole evolution. Yeah, and, and to add to that, you know, from our experiences of um, working with, with IBM, you know, as we mentioned, I mean, integrating the old and the new is a challenge. So, you know, with, with that, IBM brings in capital markets and digital assets, domain expertise, and combines that with technology expertise and, and process expertise. And the fact that IBM is prevalent in many, many uh, financial organizations is also a, a benefit because some of those challenges of integrating kind of that old and new uh, become somewhat easier with inherent internal knowledge. But the other, the other thing I really like actually is we know innovation can come from outside in and, and th there's a collaborative approach that's needed. So, so I like the way in which IBM can work with you know, select fintechs like us and then go into um, capital markets uh, opportunities you know, on the buy and sell side and really create something tangible and deliverable, as Sarkit as as said, you, that works and has the right process around it. Because again, you know, trusted ecosystems are, are key here. And, and then, you know, it's great kind of delivering something to market, but reputationally, whether it's an asset manager, a bank, a broker, they need it to work. Uh, you know, they can't, uh, they, they can't deal with um, hacks or any of the other security flaws. And a, a lot of the work, that IBM have done on the density and security, when we map that with uh, some of our domain expertise on the marketplace and infrastructure side, um, together with IBM, you know, create something that's really very interesting that can be built built around. Just to add to um, where where I see this, I, I completely agree about interoperability. From a from a business perspective. What we want to be able to do, we do want to be able to work with the other exchanges. We also want to be able to offer co-listings with, with other exchanges. So I think it's really important that not only from a, say, technology perspective, which I think will drive the change, but also from a regulatory convergence perspective, because what happens in one jurisdiction is very different to another jurisdiction. And sometimes the technology can be the bridge between those, those regulatory capabilities 
or there may have to be some form of fungibility between different regulatory bodies. No, that's very true, Michael. That's well, well, well said, and and that's it, it's a challenge and an opportunity in itself. Right, and uh, our enterprise clients, where we are present uh, day in day out, we we have this dialogue. Like, uh, and one key important point is how do you keep working with the old and embrace the new? And that's where the biggest opportunities are. As big banks are announcing uh, day after day, you know, solu- uh, uh, their initiatives around digital assets, digital custody. Uh, it's one thing to announce, the second thing to make it work in a regulatory compliant way with the existing way of doing things, uh, especially for institutional investors and under the scrutiny of SEC and other kinds of regulatory bodies. And, uh, and it's, it's, an, it's an opportunity and as a challenge as well, because uh, it needs same level of uh, diligence and same level of, uh, of guaranteed results and outcome to, to make those this new technologies embrace and work with the old ones. And that's where you know, we are very heavily focused from advisory and consulting opportunities and, and also including additionally new technologies like AI and mesh machine learning and automation yeah. to further leverage on, uh, on how to adopt this uh, tokenization and other digital assets. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I, I think that's all we have time for. Um, again, I think I speak for all of us when I say it's been a really interesting discussion today. So thank you, Saka, Harinder, and Michael for joining us. And for everybody watching at home, I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. Cheers. Thanks great. very much. Cheers. Thank you so much.